Well, welcome. I'm Gordon McCall, and this is our new Monterey Motorsport Park development. Uh, we're going to take a look inside. We'll take a look at some motorcycles and cars and uh, give you a little background on what my involvement in Car Week is. So come on in. So along with my wife, Molly, we co-host together the McCall Motorworks Revival, which is held at the Monterey Jet Center, which is literally about a half a mile from here. So uh, this has turned into my home away from home. I'm a partner on this development. Uh, this is some of my stuff. I've been a car, bike, a car guy and a bike guy my whole life. And this is a bit of a reflection of that. So I've brought some, uh, some fun things in here, which I enjoy seeing every day. It kind of inspires me to see my old Hot Wheels and Corgi toys and Matchbox toys and uh, a little crazy as an adult saying that, but uh, I love being surrounded by this stuff. So. Car Week, unfortunately, as you all know, is not happening. Thank goodness for the Peterson Virtual Car Week, which we're real proud to be a part of. Uh, you'll be able to see a glimpse into what that's all about coming up shortly. But uh, for now, let's take a look at a few bikes. This is what started it all off for me. Uh, at the age of 14, I had a Honda CL90. That one's at my home garage. But uh, I'm really into race bikes, as you can tell. Uh, I really enjoy race history. Um, you know, this, uh, this particular bike, Yamaha TZ750, if you weren't riding a TZ750 for an 11 year period of time, you were not gonna win the Daytona 200, which is a really big accomplishment. These bikes were dominant in their day. And a matter of fact, this exact bike is the bike that inspired uh, Moto America to be born. So uh, this was in my office, my other office, and uh, we had a great conversation. And next thing you know, there's a, a road racing series because of a motorcycle, which is very apt. Um, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but every bike here does have a story. This is arguably one of the ugliest race bikes ever built. <laughs> it's a 1971 BMW 750, what they called the, uh, the F750 series. Uh, it's, it's a bike that was the precursor for Reg Pridmore uh, before he won the championship in 1976 on the R90S. It all started with this very bike. So not the prettiest uh, bar, girl at the bar, I should say, but um, kind of a fun bike. Kind of a fun bike, loads of history there. So many road racers back then started their careers on these little TD250 Yamahas. It's like a little piece of jewelry. Uh, I feel like a bit of a trained circus bear when I ride it, but uh, these things are so nimble and you really, you really learn how to work uh, very little horsepower uh, in your favor. So fun, fun bikes. I love the Yamaha livery, uh, just really, really neat stuff. Big drum brakes, that's a great era in my book. Uh, this BSA is a, it's an A65, it's a 650 that was detuned to a 500cc uh, Grand Prix bike, uh, raced at Daytona several, several times. Uh, it's a 71, it's on a Rickman chassis, which is kind of unusual, chromoly Rickman chassis. And a guy named Butch Donahue raced this bike and finished as high as fourth at Daytona, which was uh, not a bad deal for a privateer. Um, as you can tell with these next four bikes, I'm really into Norton's and I have been since I was 16 years old. There was a janitor at Carmel High School here in town that had a Norton Commando and he used to just drive me crazy starting that thing up after football practice every day. I'd hear that thing idling out there and I knew there'd be a day when I had a Commando. Well, I've kind of taken that to a, a, a little bit of an extreme. I love this 72 production racer. Um, I'm tall. This bike is meant for a tall rider. Um, timeless design in my book. Really, really fun bikes to ride. They vibrate like crazy, but they are so satisfying to ride. Uh, back in 65, if you wanted to, you could completely trick out your Norton Atlas, which is what this bike is. It's a 65, 650 Atlas, which has all the Dunstall equipment on it. So if you went to your dealer, they would sell you all the Dunstall bits and pieces, which is what makes this a full-on cafe bike today. And uh, really, really fun bike to ride. One of my favorites though is the 70 Norton Commando S. The S model was a little rare. It had the high pipes, um, just a quintessential British road bike. Uh, really, really fun bike to ride. And you know, these Norton twins just make a, a wonderful sound. Um, what built up the Norton reputation leading up to that, particularly at the Isle of Man, was the infamous Norton Manx, which is what this bike is. 62, 500 cc single was raced by a guy named Buddy Perriott. It's the only race bike he ever raced was this very bike. He was also the first American to score Grand Prix points. And he did that in 1962 at the Daytona race. So before 
Wayne Rainey and Eddie Lawson and Kenny Roberts and all these wonderful Americans that we know as, as world champions, there was a guy named Buddy Perriott who, uh, who scored points on this Manx. So I think, uh, I think they're pretty iconic bikes as well. And you'll find a Manx in just about every major car collection nowadays as well. So I love that bike. Um, as far as cars, I'm, I'm one of those guys that really is drawn to affordable classics. Uh, I drive and work on my own stuff. So I, uh, I really like these kind of more entry level, for lack of a better description. I think of the 240Z as that. Uh, the Z28, same thing. That's a 72 Z28. Interestingly, uh, in 1972, there was a UAW strike, and they only built 2,500 of those cars, which is, as you know, for an American car, incredibly low production number. But I love the styling on it. Um, I never had a muscle car in my day, so I'm kind of reliving a period of time when I, when I missed out on horsepower. So uh, at that time, when I was getting, first getting my driver's license, a Datsun was my first car. And I had a Datsun 510, which was really, really the car that set me off into the car world. Um, of course, at that time, I wanted a 240Z, but couldn't afford one. So later in life, I acquired a 240Z, and I've had this car for a while now, and I just love this thing. I've modified it. It's got Webers on it and all kinds of fun stuff, five-speed gearbox, et cetera. Um, really, really a cool car to drive. Uh, the similarities between a Z28 and a Datsun 240Z are kind of amazing. Um, what I love about the Datsuns is that they're a car that anybody can work on, literally with simple hand tools. Um, you know, I've got a background in mechanical stuff, but you don't need that to do a Weber conversion with a cam, headers, et cetera. It's just a straight six. It's, it's just this side of a tractor motor. I mean, they're really, really basic motors that are really fun to work on and modify. And you can get these cars to get up and go. I mean, you can just about run with anything. Well, you know, it's funny, the Z28 Camaro, and this one's a 1972 model, of which uh, I mentioned earlier, only 2,500 were built, which is just crazy low production numbers for a domestic car. Uh, this car shares a lot in common with the 240Z. It also shares a lot in common with Pininfarina designs from the same era. Bill Mitchell was, was heavily influenced by the Ferrari Daytona and other Pininfarina designs. And if you look at these cars closely, you can kind of squint and see a little Daytona-ish approach. Long hood, slant back, uh, proportions of it are similar. Very much can be said about the 240Z as well. Z28 is a ton of fun. Basic, basic American power. 350LT1 with a four-speed Muncie gearbox. Uh, super fun to drive, super fun to work on. Probably the simplest car. Here I'm talking about how easy a Datsun is to work on. I don't think it gets much easier than a 350 small block Chevy. I mean, these things, uh, just super easy. There isn't anything complicated about these cars. They're also the kind of car that won't leave you on the side of the road. So, you know, they're super reliable. Um, this one I did lower. Uh, these cars in their day sat a little high which was, uh, I think, the look in the 70s was skinny polyglass tires and a bit of a jacked uh, ride height. So I brought it down a little bit, which gets it to handle a little bit better. But um, it's just a super fun car to drive. And as you can see, I've got, a, I've got a thing for silver cars. But if this car isn't disco, I don't know what is. White stripes, white interior, it's all stock. I mean, this is how the car came. So it's, it's a hoot. I get a kick out of it. This car over here belongs to my wife. Molly, this is her little cruiser. It's a 70 280 SL four-speed car, which makes it a little, a little unusual. But uh, we actually had, it's funny, all these years, and next year we'll mark our 30th anniversary of the Jet Center event. Uh, we, I've never had any of our own stuff in the show. Uh, a couple of bikes, but we've never put a car in it uh, until last year. I decided to put this car out there. Uh, we put it in the hangar, and it was really a lot of fun to see Molly taking part, uh, not just in organizing the event, which she does. She does all the heavy lifting on that show. Uh, but it was fun to see her enjoying a moment with her car amongst uh, fellow car enthusiasts. So we had a lot of fun doing that. And it really is a lovely car. I mean, these cars are just kind of classic elegance. And uh, she really, really enjoys driving this. So which reminds me, I think I need to bring it home with me tonight. So time to switch it out for the weekend. But, uh, you know, it's funny. It's safe to say that all of us car people started with models, whether that was Hot Wheels, Corgi toys, Matchbox cars, you name it, right? We all had them. We were all pushing them around on the rug, racing each other, et cetera, et cetera. Well, over the years, the 143rd collection is something that, uh, that I've really, really gotten into and, and really enjoy. I had a very dear friend of mine, a guy named Ned Tannen, who was a, a major car guy and movie guy and all the rest of it. But Ned was just a dear friend. And Ned and I shared uh, exchanging 143rd scale models uh, for a 30-year period of time. 
Uh, a lot of these are from Ned that we've, you know, swapped over the years. And uh, I, they're, to me, they're just heartwarming. There's just something about being able to have a bunch of cars that you're familiar with the real live version of it. But to have a scale model of it is just uh, really nice to have. And uh, I sure miss Ned, but I get, to, uh, I get to remember him every day by looking at the various models that we've traded back and forth. So that to me has been a ton of fun. And I think, uh, like I said, if, uh, if anyone is expressing an interest, if any kids are expressing an interest in cars, get them started with some, some Hot Wheels or, you know, something, uh, something to give them the plant that seed, because it certainly, that's what happened with me. I, I got that at an early age. Getting back to two wheels, there's a couple things in here that are not mine. I'm just babysitting them for now. They belong to a very dear friend of mine, a gentleman named Wayne Rainey, who's also bought a spot here at our Monterey Motorsport Park. This is Wayne's novice bike from 1979. It's a Shell Thuit 650 Yamaha flat tracker. And uh, it's just amazing to listen to Wayne talk about what this bike did for his career. You know, all these guys that went on, and you may or may not be aware, but Wayne was a three-time world champion MotoGP racer had huge successes. He's now the president of Moto America. He's looking for the next American world champion. Uh, but he says he learned so much about throttle control racing in the dirt. And this is the very bike that he did it on. So this bike will go into his space when it's ready. Uh, this bike, interestingly enough, led to this bike, which uh, I'm absolutely just honored as a friend to be able to babysit this bike for him until his space is done. So this is his 1991 YZR500cc Grand Prix bike. Absolutely amazing motorcycle that arguably should be in the museum in Japan, in the Yamaha Museum. When Wayne retired, Yamaha gave him this bike as a thank you uh, for all that he's done for the brand. He's an amazing brand ambassador. Wayne is just an amazing guy all around, but uh, I never get tired of looking at this bike from the titanium exhaust to the uh, first generation. This was the first Grand Prix bike to have carbon fiber disc brakes on it. And to listen to Wayne tell the story of what those were like to work with um, and how much of an improvement those made on the bike, it's just amazing. So, I mean, this is the equivalent of looking at a Schumacher F1 Ferrari. It really is. So this bike will go into Wayne's space when he's, uh, when he's ready, when he's finished with his space. Uh, in the meantime, I have no complaints looking at it and I do it every day. I love it, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So let's go take a look real quick. I've got an office here. Every one of our units uh, at Monterey Motorsport Park has a mezzanine space. And it's up to every owner to decide what they want to do with it. In my case, I actually work out of this space. So I've got a conference table downstairs for meetings. But upstairs is my office. And I've also got a two-wheeled effort up here as well. So come on up. And I think perhaps something of note is uh, Terry Cargus, executive director of the Peterson Museum, <laughs> is very familiar with these Boltaco Matralas. Um, Terry used to sell these bikes when they were new. So Terry is very, very knowledgeable on these bikes, and he probably understands why this bike is in my office and not being ridden. Uh, as much as it's a performing motorcycle and actually was the fastest 250, on the road back in 1967, but uh, I'm six foot five, I weigh about 220, and this is not the bike for me, although I love looking at it. So I have it in my office, so I get to look at it every day. But uh, it also reminds me of Terry, so I get to think of Terry every day too. <laughs> Who thought a Boltaco uh, Matrala would do that, right? But uh, I've just made a nice little comfortable space to get creative and think about what it is that we're gonna do with uh, our quail shows with the Jet Center, you know, all that stuff kind of comes out of my head here. Um, I do often get asked, so what's up with the silver set? So that was my mom's who passed away a few years ago. When I was a kid, that silver set was on my chore list of things that I had to polish like every other week. So I love making things shine. It's a big part of my life. I love clean cars. I love fast cars. I love all of that, but they gotta be clean first. And I am convinced that that seed was planted with me with this silver set. So that's the reason why I've got it here and I get to look at it every day. But uh, one of the images that I love up here is this, uh, it's an unattributed photograph. I'm trying to find the photographer that I can give the credit to. 
But uh, this lovely black and white photograph is Pete Lovely crossing the finish line in his Ferrari Testarossa at Laguna Seca at the very first race there in 1957. That only happens once and it was captured in this incredible image. So I'd like to find out who, uh, who belongs to the image. Maybe someday, uh, maybe someday I will, but I just love looking at it. Laguna Seca is literally 10 minutes from here. So I have uh, a lot of affection for that track and I've, I've been on that track and just about everything, but seeing this picture every day, just, I just love looking at it. So anyhow, this is, uh, this is my home away from home. And uh, I, I, I absolutely feel fortunate to be able to have a workspace that uh, if I'm having a rough day with paperwork, with office work, I just go downstairs and adjust the valves on an old Ducati or something and it kind of resets my mind and gets me back in the, back in the mood to be creative again. But uh, anyhow, this is, uh, this, is, this is my home away from home. I'm into aviation as well. I've got a few aviation models, uh, not as many as the car, the car world, but uh, I love airplanes as well. And quite frankly, I don't know too many car folks that, that aren't into airplanes as well. There's such a common thread between the two and motorcycles for that matter. So anyhow, this is, uh, this is what my uh, kind of behind the scenes life is like. So we are looking forward to uh, the Peterson virtual week, I think is brilliant. Yeah, and it looks like just about everybody's come together to participate in it. You know, we all really miss the idea that car week isn't going to happen. Uh, it's actually really sad, you know, not just for those of us that produce events, but you know, it's been a pilgrimage for so many people for so many years that, um, it's going to be sad that it doesn't, it doesn't happen this year, but, uh, in a way it is happening through the Peterson virtual event. Uh, I'm thrilled to be a part of that. And, you know, we're looking forward to our, our next year, you know, it's going to be 30 years next year. So we'll get through this virtual week and then we're going to build towards putting together a, a heck of a show next year. And same can be said, I'm the co-founder of the Quail Motorsports Gathering in August, as well as the Motorcycle Gathering in May. And we're looking forward to getting those two events back up live and running as well. I know all of us uh, are abiding by all the rules uh, and regulations that we have to in these days. Uh, but and none of those rules and regulations are preventing us from having fun with cars. So. Let's keep doing that and look forward to uh, look forward to this virtual car week. It's gonna be a ton of fun.